Hello and welcome to the debate on France Van Cat. Now, it's the home straight in the race for the White House. 2008 will certainly be an election for the history books, with polls overwhelmingly pointing to Barack Obama becoming the country's first black president. Queues are snaking around the block at polling stations across the country, with turnout set to be exceptionally high. But Obama's Republican rival John McCain hasn't given up the ghost. He's campaigning to the last, proudly proclaiming the Mac is back and pinning his hopes on an incredible last-ditch turnaround. So, plenty to talk about in the debate, and I'm joined here in the studio by Eric Pape, an American journalist and contributor to Newsweek magazine, and by Franz Van Katt's very own business editor, Raphael Kahan. Joining us from Washington by satellite is Jim McCarthy of CounterPoint Strategies, and Astro Teller of Cerebrum Capital is with us from Las Vegas. Gentlemen, many thanks for coming on to the show. We should also be joined any second now by David Mercer from Washington of Mercer and Associates. Now, vote early and vote often, this quote frequently attributed to Chicago's former Democratic boss, the Mayor Richard Daley. Well, it certainly seems that a lot of people voted early, about 30 million of them, Eric Pape, and people are turning out en masse. All of the candidates and their running partners have voted already. Is this high turnout good news for Barack Obama? Uh, it certainly looks like it, it, it is, and by all indications it should be. Um, in general, high turnouts tend to favor uh, Democrats, um, but it, it's really going to depend where the high turnout is. We're talking state-by-state state battles here, um, and, and there are areas where weather could come into play, um, where, where other factors can come into play. But we've already seen a, a, a massive advance vote by, by mail, and, and I think that that's going to be one of the key factors in this election. Jim McCarthy in Washington, what do you make on the, on the turnout point? Well, I'm not so convinced it's going to favor uh, Obama so much this time. So much of the enthusiasm you're seeing for him is coming from states which are already heavily leaning his way. So, yes, he's rallying the base, but whether it's going to uh, motivate people who are still on the fence, the undecideds, I think is a little bit less certain. And, in fact, there's a, a counterbalancing factor on the GOP side. I, 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 you know, I, I sense that a lot of voters are... Uh, coming out because of the uh, enthusiasm generated by Sarah Palin. And uh, that's happening in a lot of states, particularly in the West, where undecided voters are swinging to the GOP in large part because of the enthusiasm and novelty and, you know, groundbreaking nature of her campaign. So I think a lot of the normal metrics that you might expect about a high voter turnout may apply in some unusual ways this time around. Well, John McCain, the Republican candidate, admitted earlier today that he still sees himself as the underdog, but that he thinks that the, in the battleground states, the key battleground states, that things are closing up. Astro Teller, do you think that John McCain is telling the truth, or is that just wishful thinking? I don't know if Astro Teller well, can hear I us there. I think it's largely wishful thinking, but he certainly... Yes, I can hear you fine. Excellent. Uh, Go ahead, Astro Teller. I think Astro that's Teller, largely please. wishful thinking, but of course... Uh, I think that that's largely wishful thinking on John McCain's part, but of course he, he needs to say that in order to have any chance. I think one of the interesting things that we're going to see during the day today is that uh, the early polls, uh, that is the people who voted before today, I think were uh, biased towards or more of them voted for Barack Obama, but that's actually going to have something of a compensating factor. The early exit polls... Um, are going to start looking a little more John McCain heavy because many Barack Obama supporters have already come out. Between that and the fact that the pollsters were burned in the last two elections getting, you know, particularly Florida wrong um, last time for, for Kerry and then for Gore, and actually in both cases, uh, what we're going to see is that the media is going to be really quiet during the day today because they're not going to know how to interpret the exit polls. And I think that's going to keep John McCain in the sort of I might still be able to win camp pretty much until 6 or 7 o'clock tonight Eastern time. Go ahead, Aaron. Um, it, it, it seems to me, though, the, the, the real issue is whether he can get the votes out in a place like Nevada. Um, that, you know, ra rather than focusing on the when, when they can say different things, and obviously they're going to be pushing up until the very last moment, um, I, I, I'm actually interested to know, do you see people in Nevada being – the ground game of the McCain campaign, is it very active today? Because I've heard that the, the McCain uh, campaign doesn't have the same presence um, and that they may, they may have a very hard time getting, getting the numbers up high enough. Yeah, so, I mean, I'm in Nevada to watch that exact process. And uh, what I'm seeing here in this state 
is that the Obama campaign is much more active on the ground. Uh, there may be a lot of uh, call banks that are active for McCain, but as far as I can tell, uh, the McCain campaign has really focused in several of the eastern states, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and Florida at the top of that list. And that's pretty much where they're making their last stand and that they've pulled out of a number of states like Nevada to a large extent. I just don't see them here on the ground being very active. David Mercer hopefully can hear us in Washington. And uh, I can. Excellent news. Uh, now, David Mercer, do you think John McCain can pull off this escapology act, if you will, this an 11th hour comeback that he's pinning all of his hopes on? Uh, in my opinion, I don't think so. I think uh, John McCain and the Republicans are uh, in the fight to reduce the margin by which they lose. Uh, but I would say that uh, the Obama campaign has the ball and they're going in the end zone and uh, for another uh, score as they have throughout this campaign. And I think when you tally it all up, uh, it's going to be a matter of just how big the margin is as opposed to whether who won or not. Eric Pate back in the studio here with us. Do you think this election has been more about personality than policy, that a charge frequently leveled at Barack Obama by the McCain camp was that people didn't know who Barack Obama was? I, I think that they're, they're pointing to what they've often referred to as, a, as his exoticness. Um, I don't agree, though. I think, I think this campaign is about politics. Uh, he branded himself so completely to change so early on um, and change a change from the current politics, from the tone, but also the substance. Uh, I think that that's been the driving force of his campaign, uh, so much so that, that John McCain made a shift relatively late in the campaign to say, I too am changed. But when someone else is already branded to it, it's, it's sort of hard to take that thunder away. I think to succeed on that, John McCain would have had to really run uh, in a much stronger way against uh, uh, George Bush. And I think early on he was, he was too cautious about doing that. I think it would be paying off now if he had. Jim McCarthy, that uh, the odds was certainly stacked against a Republican candidate given uh, the Bush presidency and uh, wars and on foreign fields and the current financial crisis. Yeah, look, th there's been a large block of undecided voters that's remained about the same size for the last, oh, two or three weeks. That's really when a lot of voters really crystallize and decide who they're actually going to vote for. That number still remains pretty big. And um, I've seen a number of the GOP ads that have been rolled out nationwide in the last 72 hours that are extremely effective, very hard hitting on Obama, really striking at some of his contradictions and policy vulnerabilities. I mean, I wish that they had done it a lot sooner, but I don't think you can discount uh, that enormously size, about you know, 12 to 15 percent undecided vote that remains out there. So you combine that with the margin of the error in the polls, and I, st I still think a lot remains to be seen. I, I still think there's room to, to, to gain there. Whether those McCain messages will resonate, having only run them for, what, four or five days now in the final stretch, playing all their final ace cards, that's another question. I'm not sure. I like the messages. I wish they'd been saying them longer, though. But there's a lot of people out there that still haven't made up their minds. It, it, it's, this is Eric Pape. It's, it's, it's worth asking the question whether some of those people might not still be undecided tomorrow. I mean, just because people say they're undecided doesn't mean they're actually going to go vote. David Mercer in Washington. This is a U.S. first $1 billion election. Barack Obama with those half-hour campaign ads across national TV. Getting the message across has certainly been Barack Obama's forte, not least because he's been so well bankrolled. Uh, I think you're right on both counts, both because of uh, his ability at fundraising, and as we all know, him raising $150 million in just one month. Um, and that money went to, as uh, has been commented, to getting out the early vote, uh, which has done a great deal to reduce the numbers of undecideds. And I would argue that that undecided vote is now at 6 percent, maybe at 7 percent. And then we have the independent candidacies of Bob Barr and Ralph Nader, who are going to take some of that vote as well. So even if you gave McCain, uh, even with his message, which I don't think has been resonating, has been bouncing off the voters, uh, um, even if you give that to him, 90% uh, of the undecided, uh, he still would be at a range of uh, approaching Obama. But you're right, this campaign is not only a billion dollar, uh, the presidential itself will go to $2.3, $2.4 billion, adding then to the other federal candidates, both running for the U.S. Senate and the House of Representatives. We're talking about a $5 billion uh, election. We're now into politics being an industry. 
Astro Teller, it's worth repeating to you our know, viewers. Speaking of this, go ahead. I'm sorry. So, I, I just want to pick up on the mention just now of the Senate races. So the Democrats have the outside potential to not only pick up a number of seats, which is almost certain to happen, but to actually pick up a filibuster-proof uh, majority in the Senate. And I Absolutely. think at this point, if something swings undecided voters, it's more likely to be the fear of a heavily Democratic Senate and House combined with an executive branch for the Democrats uh, than it is because people in the undecided bloc particularly want to vote for McCain. So I think one of the things to watch today is how the Senate races go. But Eric Pape with us in well, this... I, uh, go ahead, David Mercer. I, I was going to say that I think that's a, a, a scare line that the Republicans would like to have out there that... Uh, by having Democratic control of the House and Senate along with Obama's candidacy or his election as president, uh, that somehow we're, we're not going to have a check and balance. I don't think that's correct. I think that uh, with the, uh, if you look at the House races, um, they're going to be moderate um, uh, members coming in. They're coming in out of Republican districts. If you look at Senate pickups where we're trying to get into a filibuster-proof vote, um, they're going to be coming from red states. So you're going to have have uh, people that are going to work with Obama, not necessarily just for the sake of challenging, challenging, but getting this country on the right course, and certainly one that uh, will be different than the course we've uh, been confronted with over the past eight years. And uh, on top of that, I'd like to add, when, yeah, I, I'm when, not making it. When, when you're fundamentally arguing, and I'm not saying it to you, I'm saying that, that some Republican candidates who are running for Senate have been saying this, when your fundamental argument is you should elect me to be your senator because you don't want the other party to have enough power to put through its policies, it, it reeks of desperation. It, it reeks of you don't have other arguments to get you there yeah. or you think they're not going to work. Well, let's get back to the, the presidential election. We can talk more about the I'm Senate making, and House I'm races later. I'm not making But um, let's bring in Jim McCarthy, who's there in, in Washington, as is David Mercer. I'd like to ask you, Jim, what do you think happened between early September when McCain was riding high in the polls with this post-convention bounce after Sarah Palin had, had dazzled the Republican faithful with her speech at the convention, and now when Barack Obama is so far ahead going into the closing stages? Well, obviously, it was the change in the, uh, the fortunes of the U.S. economy, and particularly on Wall Street. Uh, that was a big uh, factor that you know coincided at that period. But I'm not sure McCain handled that as well as he could have. Early out of the gate, uh, he uh, had seemingly you know, different kinds of messages about how he would handle it, suspending his campaign. He was inconsistent. And that was really a, actually a great opportunity for him. I mean, a lot of the problems we got in were as a result of excessive regulation put in place by uh, the Democratic policies, and especially Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, the two big federal, federally backed mortgage institutions uh, that drove the whole spearhead of that crisis. He could have clobbered the Democrats on, on, on that issue and instead sort of wavered a little bit. It took him three or four weeks to really nail down how problematic, how risky, how dangerous uh, Obama's economic policies, especially in combination with a left-wing Congress with Pelosi and Reid, could be for the economy. And that, that is just a catastrophic for free markets, for economic dynamism, for American business. I mean, he had a golden opportunity to really hammer that message home. And instead, he appeared to want to try to somehow quarterback the crisis instead of talking about how we got there and how we should get out of it. Uh, that's where I think the real turning point was in, in that period. We'll talk a lot more about the economy with I, our I, business editor, Raphael Kahan, in the second half. We're starting to run out of time for this first part of the debate. Eric Pape, if you'd like to make a final point before we head into the uh, news. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I wanted to, to, to address that, the very issue that, that he just broke, um, brought up, which is McCain seemed to, to make two big mistakes. One was he at times seemed to be in favor of regulation to fix the situation and, and at other times to say that, that there had been too much. So it, w it was a very blurry message. The other thing that I think helped to really undermine him is that uh, Sarah Palin started to speak with her own words. Initially, at that, sp that was a speech prepared by other people. It had been worked on for a long time before she was even selected with some elements of her thrown in after the fact. Um, but once she, there was the, 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 the interview with her on Katie Couric. Um, and from the moment where she was, she was making these comments that were just out there, um, I, I think that that really undermined people's sense of John McCain to say, how could you have picked this person? 
We'll have a lot more time to talk about the Palin effect and the economy and how that's all playing together as people continue to vote across the United States. Barack Obama versus John McCain in the race for the White House. Join us again after the news for the second half of the Franz Van Kat debate. Stay tuned. See you then. <laughs> Hello and welcome back to the debate on France Van Kat. Just a few short hours now until we know the name of the president-elect, be it Barack Obama or John McCain. I'm pleased to say I'm still joined in the studio by Eric Fape, an American journalist and contributor to Newsweek magazine, and by France Van Kat's very own business editor, Raphael Kahan. And by satellite, we've got three guests for you this evening. David Mercer of Mercer & Associates from Washington, uh, we have Jim McCarthy, also in Washington, of CounterPoint Strategies, and Astro Teller of Cerebellum Capital, who joins us from Las Vegas. This second half of the debate, we're going to start with Raphael Cahan, our business editor here at France Van Cat. Now, in recent weeks, the McCain camp has really focused in on this idea, the attacks on Barack Obama, of Barack Obama, he's a socialist, that he wants to share the wealth. But Obama joked that, well, he once shared his toys in kindergarten, Raphael Kahan, <laughs> is Barack Obama a socialist? Well, if uh, repealing the uh, Bush tax cuts for taxpayers earning $250,000 and more <laughs> every year makes you a socialist, well, I mean, you would find many socialists among politicians, and not only in Europe. Uh, it sounds more Keynesian to me than outward socialism, and, and if you look at uh, the uh, different various uh, projects supported by uh, uh, Barack Obama and his uh, program, uh, like, you know, investing in infrastructure, also try to uh, uh, develop this uh, uh, health care uh, uh, coverage. I think this can be considered socialism in the U.S. because this is quite new, but you could also uh, find uh, uh, roots in these uh, uh, different proposals in the U.S. recent history, uh, post-World War II history. Well, these are very difficult times for the U.S. economy. Who do you feel is better placed to get the American economy growing again, John McCain or Barack Obama? Well, of course, that will depend on the, uh, uh, of course, the, the feelings of, uh, uh, first of all, the uh, investors, also homeowners. Uh, it's uh, to a, a, a certain extent a question of, of confidence, and we've seen that since September with uh, uh, the uh, uh, financial uh, markets uh, thrown into a tailspin and, and this uh, lack of confidence uh, 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 and this contagion spreading to the uh, uh, broader economy. Now, uh, it's quite obvious that uh, there is much hope behind uh, Barack Obama's uh, candidacy. You also see that he has the solutions for funding some of his uh, uh, proposal uh, through by uh, 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 an example this uh, uh, by repealing part of the uh, Bush tax cuts. It's not quite as clear for uh, McCain what he would do, but it's clear that for McCain the main incentive comes from tax cuts, same solutions as the one that have been uh, actually uh, uh, experienced by the Bush administration at the beginning. And how would you expect Wall Street to react on Wednesday? It's been a very volatile time of late, but how will they react in the event of a McCain win or an Obama win? Well, judging by uh, what we saw on the European markets today, which all uh, ended up the day with solid gains, uh, between 3 and 5% gains on, uh, uh, in Paris, in London, uh, in Frankfurt as well, we can expect that uh, as investors are getting closer to uh, uh, the uh, results of these elections, uh, and of course the uh, uh, odds for an Obama victory uh, becomes of course more and more uh, uh, obvious, it seems that uh, this possibility doesn't seem to scare them as much as it could have uh, a few months ago. Astro Teller in Las Vegas, your comments on what Rafael Cahan has just told us. Well, one of the things I, I find interesting is that Sarah Palin actually is the governor of the most socialized uh, state in our union. I'm not sure if many people in um, France and in Europe understand this, but Alaska, unlike the rest of the Union, has its ma majority producer of wealth is the oil that it produces and sends to the United States, the rest of the United States. And this money is actually shared, or the profits of this money is shared among all of the people who live in Alaska. So I, I think that the um, lobbying of the socialist bomb is much more about 
uh, trying to scare people than it is really about the policy difference. I completely agree uh, with the comment that was just made that Wall Street seems to be responding very positively to what it predicts. And if you go to the online trading markets like Intrade, you will see that people at this point are placing their dollars, are making their bets, and are overwhelmingly betting uh, with money that they can lose that Obama will win. And Wall Street seems to be very positive on this, judging from the last couple of days. Let's bring in Jim McCarthy of CounterPoint Strategies in Washington. In your eyes, Jim McCarthy, uh, is Barack Obama a socialist? Well, it's so it's so funny the way that the, the way that the left wing seems to downplay the significance, and Wall Street doesn't mind it. You know, the difference between Alaskan oil money is that it comes out of the ground. What Obama wants to do is take money out of other people's pockets. Uh, it's taking money from one group of people and giving it to another group of people. Now, you can call that socialist or Keynesian, but whatever you do, it's fundamentally a collectivist approach. You're taking money from one folks, some folks, and giving it to others. And the number, the income rate at which Obama keeps saying he's going to tax people, the ones who are he's taking the money from, keeps dropping. It started at something like 250,000. It's now, at, last I heard, 130. And I just think that's a fundamentally wrong-headed policy that's at odds with everything the country ought to stand for, and it's certainly at odds with free market economics, which is what Wall Street's all about. It, is, um, it, you know, it, the market, to some extent... Is a return to... We're, we're not talking... Let, let David Mercer go ahead, sorry, Eric. You'll have your say in a minute. It, it, David Mercer. If I might add, I, look, getting into this socialism debate, it didn't stick, it shouldn't stick in this conversation or discussion <laughs> if we're going to get really down to it. And that is $600 billion was transferred to the top 1% of, uh, of the richest people in the United States. And we're not arguing for that to come back, but at the same time, it's come at a cost to others. We're looking to protect our jobs. We don't want them going overseas. We're looking for real wage increases. We're looking for home values to stabilize. Okay? Credit, as we've seen in this market, and with the Bush administration and governing this market and interfacing with this market, credit is to the economy what truth is to politics. It's like oxygen. Without it, both suffocate. And when it comes to the Republican brand, their bank of ideas has been found wanting. The, you know, there's no oxygen with anything that the Republicans have to offer. And here we have Obama trying to resuscitate that economy with a new faith, a new trust, a new crediting, and a new balance to how the economics should work in a fair and balanced way. As seen well, from, if, from, you look at, if you look at any, if you look at any, look at, if you look at any company in the Fortune 500 over the last eight years, it has grown <clears throat> markedly in market cap. Okay, we had a credit crisis over the last year. And yes, where are true, their jobs? Their Freeman, jobs are overseas. They're in China. They're in India. They're in Pakistan. They're not here. And we need to keep that's not true. our purchasing power. You can't do that if you don't have jobs. Jim, the unemployment ahead. rate is has the, the unemployment rate in this country has remained at a, at near four percent, about the, the, the about the optimal level for a free market economy for the last eight years. And all those companies, which are owned by shareholders, Thank ordinary God Americans with four hundred one k's, are doing Fowler, much better. Ra Raphael Kahan, our business <laughs> editor, wants to get a word yeah, in that, here, that, so we'll let him go. That was actually before the past eight years. It happened during the uh, Clinton years, the Clinton administration. That's correct. And uh, now I think, what, and we might be seeing it go up now. What can be said of Obama, though, is that he's probably more protectionist than McCain. I don't know if that's you know down with uh, uh, socialism, but for sure he's more protectionist. That's pretty pretty clear, and that's what makes him so different from traditional European socialists. Well, the, the, the well, will you can call will it. Look, I think it's pretty clear. I think it's pretty clear. I, th I think that you are going to see some caution when he becomes president, though, because nobody wants to become president in this economic crisis and act as the, the, the U.S. president did during the Great Depression. So I, I, my guess is that you're saying one thing during the campaign, and then he's going to find some, some middle ground. I, I can't see how he could take actions that would be pure protectionist and cause greater tightening of, of exchange around the world. He might be more reluctant to well, sign the, 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 the Great Depression is a, good, a great example. Well, Whatever you want to call it. Well, we can't all speak at once. Uh, <laughs> Jim McCarthy, yep. you have your say. No. Yeah, look, at the, great, the Depression's a great example. When FDR came in, he advocated a lot of the same kinds of infrastructure projects and uh, Social Security and Medicare, the big redistribution economic policies that you guys are advocating. And it, what happened? It delayed that depression and made our economic stagnation last for seven or eight more years. With economic dynamism, free market capitalism, we could be out of this crisis within, within six to 12 months. And that's the big difference between 
GOP, free market dy dynamism, and whatever you want to call your left-wing approach, socialism or Keynesian, and that's why these want. It's that's why these business. And the labels don't work. You're absolutely right. And let me just point out, we got out of the depression through FDR 1. Secondly, during the Clinton era, every number and indicator that should be up was up. Whether it was surpluses, now down, and we're into deficits. Whether it was unemployment, down during the Clinton years. Whatever numbers needed to be up, they were up. Call it what you want, okay? And in the campaign, he was the liberal coming out of the South trying to be a moderate. It doesn't matter. What we know is that the numbers that were supposed to be up were up. The numbers that were supposed to be down, down. That is the flip now in the Bush administration. And it's a brand of politics and a brand of governing that no longer holds trust and faith of the American people. And unfortunately, McCain is a victim of being associated with that. And we're sorry for that, but we've got to get this economy back on the right Astro track. Astro Teller would like get to come the in now, David Mercer. So Astro Teller can speak now yeah. from Las Vegas. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, Astro. Thanks. <clears throat> you know, I, I think, thank you. I think when you listen to the last three or four minutes that we just delivered to your viewers, it's probably no surprise now why politics ends up being less about the policies and more about whether or not people feel good about the candidates. It's very hard for them to sort out who's right and who's wrong. People are very impassioned on both sides. And I think we have just created a microcosm in the last couple of minutes of exactly how this election has played out. And fundamentally, when people go to pull the metaphorical lever today, um, they're not really going to be doing it primarily on these issues. Frustrating as that is for all of us, they're going to be doing it about who makes them more hopeful for the future in a very generic way. And, and I think we just sort of demonstrated And hopeful that for a better economy as we had in the 90s. Let's move on a little bit yeah. from the economy now. Uh, Eric Pape with me here in the studio in Paris. Just how, what, what sort of magnitude would an Obama victory have given that it's only... 43 years since the, the Voting Rights Act. Uh, uh, the, the, the idea that a 47-year-old African-American man, um, he's young, he's dynamic, he's cool, and, and part of this is what has seduced the press. There's, there's a very fresh story. As he pointed out before, he doesn't look like other people on American money. Um, I'm sorry, people who are on American money because he's not on it yet. Um, obviously, the, the impact in America um, will be enormous, speaking symbolically if you should win later today. Um, but, but I think also of, of, of great interest is, is the impact that it will have around the world. When people look at the United States and see a country where in, in, in the space of, of five decades you can have this epic transformation, uh, it's going to make them look at America in a very different light, and it's going to make them look at their own governments in many cases in a very different light. He, here in France, it's, it's currently almost unimaginable for, for a child of a minor, minority who's not from Europe to become president very difficult to imagine. Similar in Germany, uh, in Spain, in Italy, uh, very difficult to imagine even in the UK at this point. It will become possible. So to so the global impact of that, I, I think, is uh, potentially tremendous. That, that's just speaking of symbolism. It's not talking about policy in any way. Jim McCarthy in Washington, your views? Well, I, I'm similarly enthused about the, uh, the way that Palin's gone about her campaign. She's really represented a new kind of muscular, independent, spirited, uh, brand of American feminism. And um, I think that's really given a huge light of optimism and enthusiasm for conservatives. But one thing I do hope emerges from this, uh, if Obama should win, is that, is that Americans can try to put this corrosive identity politics behind us. I mean, so much of democratic politics over the last 25, 30 years has been surrounded by a, a laundry list of grievances and accusations and grudges held. And that's really been one of the most depressing and uh, you know, uh, friction-causing elements of our uh, political um, d discourse. And so I hope to some extent we can try to put that behind us. And, and the way we did, for example, when JFK became the first Irish Catholic, first Catholic president of the country, a lot of the, you know, Irish Catholic identity politics of, 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 of previous years began to recede. So I'm hoping that may usher in a new era in that sense where we're all Americans. Well, I, I think that a lot of people if in the I United point States something would, out would, to that. would be glad to move on. Um, but it, would, it and, will take people... Uh, different types of people becoming leaders in the country. Uh, David Mercer, a very quick point. I, I, I think we're running out of time. 
Sure. I think Jim is absolutely right. And you see Senate Republican candidates doing just what Obama has struck out initially in this campaign. He was going to run a straight talking uh, direct campaign with the American people attacking the challenges that we have to confront rather than the personalities or the candidates. And you got Norm Coleman, who in Minnesota is running to save his seat, running an ad to say he's not going to run negative ads. You got uh, in Oregon, you got Gordon Smith with Obama in his ads. So obviously we're on that move beyond the corrosive politics that I would like to flip back to Jim to say, come well, out gentlemen, of Lee I'm Atwater, we, come we out of Paul We could go on much, Rose. much longer, but yeah. we're out of time. I'd like yeah. to say many thanks to all of my guests. And don't forget to tune in to the American Election Special from 11 p.m. Paris time, presented by Andrea Sankey. Thanks for watching and see you again soon. Bye for now.